Hi guys, welcome to this revision summary video looking at topic 7, which is rates of reaction and energy changes. The aim for this video is to look at all the key things that you need to revise to get yourself ready for the exam. If you want to go into more detail on any particular part, I've put a link in the top right hand corner to the playlist which goes into each section of the video in more detail. Right, let's get started. We're going to start off with the first investigation you need to know of how you can investigate rates of reaction. So we're going to use some equipment that you can see on the left hand side here, and we're going to carry out the reaction where calcium carbonate, marble chip, reacts with hydrochloric acid. What will form is calcium chloride, carbon dioxide and water. So if we have a look at the symbol equation for this, calcium carbonate CaCO3, which is a solid, will react with hydrochloric acid, HCl, which is aqueous, and it will form CaCl2, which is also aqueous, CO2, which is a gas, and H2O, which is liquid. Now the key thing here is a gas is going to be produced. If that gas is produced, you will see bubbles, and those bubbles can be collected. If you can collect them, you can measure them, and you can see how changing different things affects the rate of reaction. So if we have a look at a method, the first thing you want to be able to do is measure out 50 centimeters cubed of your hydrochloric acid and add it to a conical flask as you can see on the left here. Once you've done that, you need to measure out two grams of your marble chip, calcium carbonate, and then you're going to add it to the conical flask, put the bung in the end, and then start your stopwatch. Now your end point you can choose. So you can either record how long it takes to produce 50 centimeter cubed of gas, or how much gas is produced in 20 seconds. Now there are three things you could be asked to investigate, surface area, concentration, and temperature. But the method is exactly the same each time. All we have to do is change one independent variable and keep everything else controlled the same. So if we start off with surface area, what you need to do is instead of two grams of marble chip, we're going to have two grams of my small marble chip. And then step number five, repeat for other surface areas, for large marble chips, for medium marble chips, for a powdered marble chip. And then record the time and see what the difference is. If we were to do the same for concentration, choose a concentration, 0.1 molar for example, and then repeat it with different concentrations. That's all you have to add on the end. And the same with temperature, let's say we start off with 50 centimeters cubed of acid at room temperature, this time we're going to repeat it at different temperatures. You could make those up, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees, it doesn't matter. As long as you're using different temperatures, you're going to be able to investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction. And what you will see is if you increase the surface area, increase the concentration, increase the temperature, you will see a faster rate of reaction, so more gas will be collected in a certain time. On to the second investigation, the disappearing cross. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take sodium thiosulfate and react it with hydrochloric acid. Now this produces loads of things, sulfur, sodium chloride, sulfur dioxide and water. So if we were to look at the symbol equation, Na2SO3 plus HCl goes to S plus NaCl plus SO2 plus H2O. Now the key thing here is looking at the state symbols. You can see that sulfur is a solid. If it's a solid, it's going to go cloudy. And if it goes cloudy, it will look as though the cross disappears. So if we write down the method. Again, I'm going to measure out 50 centimeters cubed, this time for my sodium thiosulfate. I'm then going to add it to a conical flask. I'm then going to place a cross on a white tile and measure out five centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid. I'm going to add it to my conical flask and start my stopwatch. I will then stop my stopwatch when you can no longer see the cross. And I can do that by making sure I look down from the top. Now the two things you can investigate here are concentration and temperature. And again, similar to the previous investigation, you don't have to change much. So if we start off with concentration, again, choose 0.1 molar, something like that. And then step five, repeat for other concentrations. And same with temperature, choose room temperature to begin with, and then repeat at 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees, and so on. And once again, you will see if you increase the concentration and temperature, the cross will disappear quicker in a shorter amount of time. 
Next section. We're going to have a look at collision theory. So how can you explain why increasing the temperature, concentration and surface area increases our rate of reaction? So this diagram in the middle here shows a low temperature, a low concentration and a low surface area. And we're going to have a look at what happens when we increase all three. So if we start off with temperature and we increase the temperature, nice and simply, as you can see here, the particles have more kinetic energy. They're moving about more. If they have more kinetic energy, they're going to be moving around faster and there are going to be more collisions. And in particular, more successful collisions per second. And if you've got more successful collisions, you'll have a faster rate of reaction. If we move on to concentration, so increasing the concentration, you can see here, I have more particles. They have the same amount of energy, but there are more of them. If you have more particles, there are going to be more frequent collisions. They're going to be occurring more often. More frequent collisions, faster rate of reaction. And finally, if you increase the surface area, as you can see here, what I've done is I've taken my solid and I've broken it down into smaller pieces or crushed it up. By doing that, the particles of my acid can reach more places. Therefore, there's a higher surface area to volume ratio. If you have a higher surface area to volume ratio, there are more frequent collisions again, and more frequent collisions means a faster rate of reaction. So you can see these definitions, these explanations are very, very similar. The next section we're going to look at is rate graphs. What happens when you increase the temperature, surface area and concentration to the rate of reaction? So here I have a graph. On the left I have my concentration of products and on the bottom I have my time for the reaction to occur. Now the important things, when it's flat the reaction has finished. My concentration isn't going up, there are no more reactions occurring. This is the steepest part here. The steepest part means it's the fastest rate of reaction, which you'd expect at the beginning of the reaction because you have the most reactants colliding with each other. So what happens if we increase the temperature, concentration or surface area? We've already said we have a faster rate of reaction, therefore the graph will be steeper and it will look like this. However, it still finishes at the same point. We still only have a certain amount of reactants, so they will finish and I will get the same concentration at the end. So it should finish like this. If I lower the temperature, concentration and surface area, it will be shallower because I have a slower rate of reaction. So it will look like this, again, finishing at the same point. You can also calculate the rates from these graphs. So for example, if you were asked to calculate the rate at 90 seconds, what you would have to do is draw a tangent. So what you do is you get your ruler and you make it so it's as flat against the curve at 90 seconds as you possibly can, as you can see here. Once you've done that, draw a nice large triangle. The larger the better, it means that you're going to be as accurate as possible. So I've gone two large boxes across. Draw your triangle in, as you can see that I'm doing here and then work out your height and your base. My height here is six centimeters cubed, and then my base going along the bottom is 60 seconds. Now to work out the rate, you take your volume in centimeters cubed and you divide it by your time that you've just worked out from the graph. So six divided by 60 gives me 0.1 centimeters cubed per second, and that is my rate at 90 seconds. Okay, that is the rates of reaction section done. We are now on to energy changes. And the first part is going to have a look at the two terms, exothermic and endothermic. So one of them is where the temperature increases, one is where the temperature decreases. If the temperature goes up, you have an exothermic reaction. And if you have an endothermic reaction, the temperature goes down. You also need to know the definition in terms of energy. So for exothermic, heat energy is given out to the surroundings and for endothermic, heat energy is taken in from the surroundings. You need to know some examples of exothermic and endothermic. Exothermic, neutralization, displacement, endothermic, salt dissolving. They're the key ones. Make sure you know them as examples for the exam. Now you can show exothermic and endothermic reactions by using reaction profiles. Reaction profiles shows you the energy of the reactants and products 
and show you what happens as the reaction goes on. Now the key thing here is for exothermic, the products have less energy than the reactants and the endothermic ones have more energy than the reactants. For exothermic reactions, that energy change is the energy given out to the surroundings, which is why the surroundings heat up. And for endothermic, that energy is taken in from the surroundings, which is why the temperature goes down. The next section is going to have a look at what happens in terms of bond breaking and bond forming, and how that links back to exothermic and endothermic. So the first thing that we have to do in any chemical reaction is we have to break the bonds. To break the bonds, you must put energy in. If you put energy in, it means bond breaking is endothermic. The second part of any reaction is bond forming. So new bonds form and energy is given out. If energy is given out, that makes bond forming exothermic. So how do we know if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic overall? Again, we look at our reaction profiles. The energy taken in is the energy needed to break the bonds. That's the part that goes up. The energy given out is the energy for forming new bonds. If more heat energy is given out when new bonds form than taken in when bonds are broken, that makes it exothermic overall. It's a very similar explanation for endothermic. The energy is still taken in when bonds are broken and energy is still given out when new bonds form. However, for it to be endothermic overall, more heat energy is taken in when those bonds are broken than given out when new bonds form. This next section only appears on the higher paper and that is having a look at bond breaking and bond forming and how you can calculate whether something is exothermic or endothermic overall. So you will be given a table in the exam that looks like this. It will have the bonds in and it will have the bond energy. So that is the energy needed to break or form the bonds. So if we start off with hydrogen, I have two HH bonds. You can see that up above. And I have one O2 molecule, which means I have one O double bond O. So what I need to do is have a look in my table. If we start off with the HH, I have two times 436 kilojoules per mole. I have one O double bond O, which means I have one times 498 kilojoules per mole. So my total energy needed to break all the bonds is 872 plus 498, which comes to 1370 kilojoules per mole. I now need to do the same on the right hand side for my new bonds forming. I have H2O and I have two of them, which means I have four HO bonds, which means four times my 464. So my energy to form new bonds is 1,856 kilojoules per mole. The next step, I have to work out the change in energy. And that is nice and simply, the energy for breaking bonds take away the energy for forming new bonds. So for example here, 1370 minus 1856 comes to minus 486 kilojoules per mole. So how does this link back to whether something is exothermic or endothermic? Nice and simply, if the answer is negative, it's exothermic. If it's positive, it's endothermic. So here it's a negative minus 486. Therefore, this reaction is exothermic. So the temperature is going to go up. Heat energy is going to be given out. This final section is going to have a look at catalysts and enzymes. So if we start off with catalysts, Nice and simply, you need to know the definition, which is they speed up a chemical reaction, but they don't get used up, so the mass stays the same. They remain unchanged at the end. The explanation for that is all to do with activation energy. Activation energy is the energy required to start a reaction by breaking the bonds, and this is where it occurs. So the way catalysts work is they lower the activation energy meaning that although you have the same number of collisions because you haven't changed the temperature, the concentration or the surface area, more of those collisions are successful because they don't need as much energy for a reaction to occur. Therefore, the rate of reaction will increase. Now, enzymes are very similar. They are biological catalysts. They speed up the reaction and they remain unchanged at the end. They stay the same. 
For example, fermentation, they're used to convert glucose into ethanol and they make the reaction happen quicker. And then finally, the only other thing you need to know from this video is what a catalytic converter is. They're used in cars nice and simply and they turn harmful gases into safer ones. So for example, nitrous oxides into nitrogen, carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide. And they do that by using a palladium or platinum catalyst. As we said, those catalysts lower the activation energy, so more of those reactions are going to be successful in turning them back into safer gases. They also work better at high temperatures because you've got higher kinetic energy, more successful collisions per second, and they have a large surface area for a larger surface area to volume ratio for more frequent collisions. And that brings this video to an end. Hopefully you found it useful. Good luck in preparing for your exams. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel, you can check out the latest video, and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.